Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the AI for Good Global Summit, all year, always online. My name is Ksenia Fontaine from the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar on AI driving digital divides and the future of African economies. The ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. And we are also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit alongside Xprize Foundation and in partnership with 36 UN sister agencies, ACM and Switzerland, our co-convener. The goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. And with our online weekly programming, we are trying to reach even more people across the globe. So please let us know where you are calling from, from which country or which city. You can use the chat function to communicate. Please make sure that you send your message to all panelists and attendees. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. The moderator will select and read out the questions to the speakers. And we are particularly counting on your participation to create a very interactive session. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Dr. John Kamara, the director of Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa and the founder of AFIA Record. John, welcome. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you, John? Very, very well. Glad to be here from Nairobi. Uh, it's evening time here and we're happy to join the rest of the world. So welcome everyone um, to the ITU Africa Summit. Uh, we're excited to be here today and we are going to jump right in because we believe that AI, it is definitely the future for Africa as an emerging continent and all the economies are emerging out of this uh, um, economy. Uh, we have some amazing people on the panel today. I'm, I'm sure as you've seen in a number of the um, marketing materials that have gone out from the ITU and a number of our esteemed guests. Uh, but our first um, keynote speaker uh, is a person of excellence, a woman who has made a lot of contribution to the development of uh, digital technologies in South Africa. And, and allow me to welcome uh, Minister Stella Tembezi Abrams from the Republic of South Africa, and she's the Minister for Communication and Digital Technologies. Minister. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon. Of course, I'm talking the South African time, and I just want to say greetings to everyone who's listening to us today, and thank you so much for joining us in this important topic that all nations are really trying their best to make sure that we, we do our best, not only as governments, but also as, um, as the citizens of, of, of the country. My name is Delanda Beni Abrahams, as it has been introduced. I'm the Minister Responsible for Communication and Digital Technologies in South Africa. And of course, uh, fellow participants, the topic, as we all know, uh, which talks to the future of work in Africa with digital divide, of course, we're looking at the AI uh, opportunities and challenges uh, to say what is it that we should do or what is it that we're not doing right in order to leverage on the opportunities that are presented by the artificial intelligence. Of course, it is my pleasure to engage with yourselves uh, this afternoon. And as we fashionable talk about building the digital economy, which requires a digital society, research has indicated that there's a lot that we need to do in order to achieve that. As we talk about research, that there's a need that we need to do, but the advantage once more is the fact that, especially in Africa, there isn't much investment that we have done for us to say we're comfortable with the status quo or we're reconsidering because uh, we've already invested a lot. We are now presented with an opportunity to invest for the future, to say how best can we leverage on the artificial intelligence technologies in order to help our countries grow their economies. As I say this, the basic thing, of course, as a person from government is to make sure that we create an enabling environment 
and the basic thing creating an enabling environment starts with the policy. So there's a need for all of us as policymakers to make sure that we develop policies, AI policies, as the different countries uh, in Africa to say, how do we then plan to work on this uh, artificial intelligence to, to resolve some of the challenges that we have, but also to enable an environment where we can build on that that you are good at. As I'm speaking from South Africa, if I were to make an example, everybody that we come from the land of gold and diamond. And of course, we also have Mercedes Benz, I can't leave that behind. But what people are not looking at, as we have seen currently that COVID, when it hit us, if I were to make an example, when it hit, when it hit us, it showed us that all the personnel that we have, the unskilled labor, can one day lose a job. And that's a reality. As they lose their job, that translates to production levels. And if you're talking about production levels, it impacts on the economy. And therefore, as the people that are responsible for policies, how do we make sure that we do appreciate that there are technologies that can help us uh, improve the production levels in order to turn around our economies? I made an example with mining, that as we have lots of unskilled people or labor in that sector, artificial intelligence has a key role to play. As much as most people talk about the threat that is um, imposed by the, the fourth industrial revolution technologies are the threat to jobs. One thing that you have not paid much attention on uh, uh, in terms of investment and providing clear directives is that of leveraging on the new jobs that can be built utilizing artificial intelligence. And of course, as I spoke about policy, there's been lots of news again, people talking about the ethics of the algorithms that are being used, uh, because it is of no value to us as Africans if when we look for particular information, it doesn't talk to who we are, or it's not a true reflection of what we stand for, which is what we have seen uh, in the previous regimes, whereby our story has to be told in a particular manner that suits the storyteller, and definitely we have not been telling the stories. Now we presented with an opportunity to say, just from programming level, how do we make sure that we get involved? How do we make sure that we have people and policies that must look into the ethics of the algorithms so that as we leverage on the usage of artificial intelligence, our people do not get to experience what they experienced in the past that have been discriminated against in the economy and in the knowledge economy that we're talking about. So that's just one component. And of course, key to the enablement that we're talking about is that, that we all agree that it matters. Data is the new oil. Others put it like that. I prefer data is the new oxygen because for us to do everything, it really requires that data, how we use it, has an impact, whether positively or negatively to whatever that we want to do. Therefore, once more as government, we are then faced with the challenge of ensuring that just like the EU has done and other regions, we come up with our own data policies that must also help create an enabling environment for innovators, for small businesses and other in industries to utilize them for economic aspects. So this is not something that can just be done by government alone. This is why in South Africa, when President Ramaphosa took a decision to establish the Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, he said, I really need a group of experts who will not be looking only at technologies, but who will be looking into the entire ecosystem of human beings, that people must eat, people must work, people must clothe, then we have minerals, as I, as I have said, and therefore we need everything that goes with it to make sure that these experts can then meet together and provide a blueprint document to say where to South Africa. And as we do that in South Africa to say, we have channeled our, our, our energies to say the commission has presented its report to the president, we are awaiting uh, for its final adoption. But the most exciting thing again came when President Ramaphosa was appointed the chairperson of the AU. 
which gave us again another opportunity as South Africa to say, what is it that we can build on that we see that has worked not only in South Africa, but also in other states? How would we make sure that we bring all the African states together in the benefit of Africans, both in Africa and in the diaspora, utilizing the expertise that they have? As we did that, of course, the AU has its own uh, working group on artificial intelligence. The Smart Africa grouping, again, has its own artificial intelligence working group, which is chaired by yours truly. And the president made a very big announcement that made us very happy to say, as part of his legacy project, he would really like to leave a legacy whereby we, he has established an Africa AI forum whereby we bring everybody in the forum, those that matter in terms of the expertise, when I say everybody, the expertise that are required from all the member states of the AU, and therefore to make sure that AU will have its own AI strategy that must help guide the different member states in ensuring that this time Africa does not miss out. I have a phrase that I like so much, that I borrowed from Mao Zedong uh, when he really decided to say it's high time that China uh, takes leadership on technologies, the charge and surpass freight. And I really believe that as Africa, we give an, an opportunity to really do that. And if we are to charge and surpass, it means we've got to stop being consumers of the technologies that come from somewhere but we also have to be inventors, which is why for us it becomes crucial to do just like our countries have done and other regions to say, we identify AI as a key technology that we think we can leverage on to change the economic status and social being of the people of, of the African continent. As we do that, of course, we are again cognizant of the fact that we have poor infrastructure in terms of the digital infrastructure which is a crucial challenge that this government we are faced with. As we saw COVID-19 hitting us and people were forced to stay out of jobs, away from offices, reality sunk, even for those that have believed that as governments, we really do not have to invest much in connectivity because people don't eat internet as you would listen to some believing so. But it was proven that we can have the best bandwidth in the offices, we can have the best technologies in the offices or beautiful offices, but there may be situations or scenarios as we have seen that we're not able to come to work. And that presented a great opportunity for us in the digital space to say, now it is people that are calling upon us to say, we see this infrastructure that we have is not sufficient. We do want to make sure that we access digital services, but we cannot because of the poor infrastructure or non-availability of, of the infrastructure at all. Because as much as we're talking about poor infrastructure, there are still areas that we do not have connectivity at all. And again, we are privileged as, as, as Africa again, because we decided to build on what we have to say as we have the Broadband Commission, what, the, what strategies therefore we can uh, employ to make sure that we partner with everyone and be able to say we're gonna invest in, in connectivity. First, treating connectivity as a basic human right is one thing that we are saying, we all agree that it needs to be done. If we do agree that people can live without money, COVID has shown us that people can live without internet. Where they have lived, we've really seen where there's been um, the divide and the disadvantages when even we had to provide education, which we all agree is a priority of any responsible government and people could not access that. I'm talking about the policies that we make as government. I'm talking about strategies that we employ, but I'm talking about resources at the same time because they go together. We may have great policies. If then money and resources are not following that, then it, it would mean that um, we're not really gonna leverage on the technologies that we have. I spoke about the impact of COVID as we have experienced it in the past months. Again, very clear in the health sector, if I were to make an example with them, whereby we all agree that the shortage of doctors, we've seen it. 
Uh, research again indicates that we need about 1.2 million doctors in Africa for us to be able to deal with the virus that we are looking at. And reality is that, that we do not have currently. And as the people in the digital technology space, ours is to say, how do we leverage on the deployment of artificial intelligence? Because people have cell phones with themselves, people have devices with themselves. How do we make sure that they can use that in order to change their social status and access the basic services that they must access without us going to get doctors where we're not gonna find? We've gone to Cuba, we've gone to other countries that we're saying, come help us. But there is the artificial intelligence that we all agree that it can play a major role. As I'm talking about that again, it is very clear that as I spoke about the broadband infrastructure, there's also the issue of the energy capabilities. Because it's important to balance energy investment because it's part of the infrastructure, because when energy is not stable once more, it then impacts on the quality of the connectivity that we would need, and therefore automatically it, 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 it impacts negatively on the kind of service that we must provide. We talk about devices, people must access the services through devices. Once more, Africa has been a consumer of all the devices that we're talking about. And we really believe that we are presented with an opportunity that we can really come up with our own, that we are talking about bridging the gap in terms of the jobs that will be lost, but we can invest in the new opportunities that are there. And as I said, it is only Africa that has lots of people who are not connected. It is only Africa that has a high digital illiteracy rate. And therefore investing in the skills, investing in the infrastructure, including the devices becomes key. As I talk about infrastructure earlier on, I mentioned the fact that we all agree that data is the new oil, but data has to be stored which means there's a need for us to invest in data, cent in, in data centers and cloud storage. And as we do that, again, we all agree, there's a need for us to leverage on the artificial intelligence to be able to do certain things in order to create uh, the new economies that we're talking about. When I spoke about what we have in the continent, I mentioned the Broadband Commission, of course, we also have the program for infrastructure development in Africa, PIDA, which is also looking at bridging the infrastructure gap and identifying, of course, the financing models uh, for sustainable broadband deployment. This is something governments cannot do alone, colleagues. This is something that requires all industries and government, all it has to do is to create an enabling environment whereby we have to agree at a particular point that's why I said that policy making becomes very important. That identification of, 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 of sectors that can really turn around the economy and resourcing those is very important. Because if we're going to say we're calling upon the private sector to come and invest in infrastructure in terms of connectivity, we've got to make sure that the environment enables that. Therefore, we've got to relax certain regulations. We've got to make sure that we look at, at tax incentives and others in order to make sure that indeed the environment for investment in Africa is conducive for investors to come and do it if we are to succeed in this journey we want to partake on. And of course, again, as we talk about the jobs that we are losing, Mackenzie mentions a very important thing if I were to be specific on South Africa again, to say we stand to create about 4.5 million new jobs. If we invest, in technologies and connectivity. But as you talk about the, the new jobs that we're gonna create, they also mentioned the fact about 3.3 million jobs uh, to be lost. This is what takes us to the need to say we've got to prioritize skills development. We've got to upskill our existing personnel. We've got to make sure that we change our curriculum, which in most cases has been designed for our people to just consume content and go and look for jobs. This is an economy that requires innovators and small businesses that must be given an opportunity to turn things around. People who must provide solutions instead of people who must just come and theorize what the framework says. 
If you look at the banks, they're also affected. And as I'm mentioning this, I keep on saying, we see AI playing a critical role. Because whether you're gonna take, talk about automated banks, whether you're gonna talk about the mines and everything, artificial intelligence plays a new role and therefore it becomes a key technology that we believe that it can change the social economic status of our people and therefore of our countries. Again, we've had in South Africa uh, the likes of Edcon, who recently announced that they stand to lose jobs. And of course, as people in the space were like, they really do not have to lose jobs if they don't have to be paying those huge sums in terms of property apologies to those that are in property business, but they can do and they can offer the services that they're offering and reskill and upskill the personnel that they have for call centers, for, for e-commerce platform, and then they still get sales people as we have seen in other countries. So we still believe that uh, artificial intelligence can really turn things around. If we go back again to the, what, the impact of COVID that we've observed. Min I'm, Minister, we're, we're almost, um, if you could just, also, I mean, we'll enjoy your conversation. But before, I just wanted to ask you one question and that, what is the South African government doing in the health space in terms of AI? And how is that helping the fight for COVID similar to what we're doing here in Kenya with the likes of Afia and other companies that are solving problems in the private sector. Thank you, thank you. Of course, in South Africa, one of the key things that we did uh, when we were hit by the COVID was to establish the ICT work streams. We, we, we spoke to all sectors to identify themselves and get organized. And I must really commend the work that has been done by the ICT work streams, which has provided more solutions uh, to the health department to say, we can deploy uh, your artificial intelligence technologies in terms of how you, you, you help in terms of track, track and tracing of the people who have been tested positive, which is now has moved, what has moved from the Department of Communications to the Department of Justice, uh, but working with the Department of Science and Innovation. That's one of the things. And of course, in South Africa, we do have the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, which does research work and has been working closely with the department to say, the Department of Health, this is how we can assist in terms of technologies. There's been lots of solutions and applications that have been provided, including blockchain technologies. Uh, I know the, 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 the teams are right now working on a platform where you get access to free information on COVID, including the material that you need to access and pointing you to where you can go and test. And all that has been done by the through the collaborative efforts of South African government and its own industries. And as I said, amongst those industries, it is the ICT work stream. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you as a keynote opening speaker. And I think a lot of the audience has learned quite a lot about what is happening. Uh, it's a conversation I want to pick up with you later around the health infrastructure in South Africa. If you allow me, I will get in touch with you later so we can also share more information with the rest of the world. Uh, next um, is uh, our next, uh, thank you very much, Minister. Our next presenter is um, Alex Sado. Alex um, works for, Alex is with Alliance for AI and he yes. has been involved in pushing education in AI in Africa for quite a while. And uh, he's going to share with us some of his thoughts about how Africa can leapfrog um, using artificial intelligence in alliance for development of AI and also in alliance for collaborative work for startups and the ecosystem. Uh, Alex. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, John, for the introduction. And it's always an inspiration to uh, listen to you, Minister, uh, as always. I will go ahead and uh, share my screen as I'll be showing you all the uh, presentation. So I will just uh, try to work that here for a moment. Okay. Fantastic. So I believe you should be able to see my screen. Great. Well, I'll start off with a story for you guys, right? Uh, the year is 2018 and Nick Litombe, Nomso Kana and myself were sitting around the table uh, basking in our perceived success. 
Uh, Nick from Cameroon was an applied physics PhD and data scientist uh, crafting energy and innovation policy for the United States government. Uh, Nomso from South Africa, uh, she is a nuclear physicist uh, turned fiber optics entrepreneur uh, deploying infrastructure in her country to reduce the cost of internet. I, based here in California, where I'm calling you from, uh, was guiding, was with NVIDIA and guiding the top five largest companies in the entire world to deploy AI solutions that billions of people will use. Uh, this all looked exciting for humanity until we had this chilling realization that uh, there was an insurmountable gap that was growing in the quality of life that humans live and this was, this was uh, because of the way people are applying the technologies that we're building. In that, in the near future, being wealthy won't be enough for you to escape this gap. The only way was that you'd have to increase the representation of people who look like you at the table where AI is built. As Minister just shared, we, you probably now see a version of this reality uh, through COVID-19. It has come to expose this gap to more people. Uh, for example, as a rich person in Nigeria, you can't now simply send your kids to America for school when the schools at home are terrible. Similarly, you can't escape the poor healthcare systems in your country and fly to London when you are sick. Uh, and as a rich person, the security systems that are getting built will still spot you as a black person. And oddly uh, as a criminal many of you wish for covid19 to end so all of this will go away uh, but i say to you that if the current application of ai continues because you don't do anything about it this problem will last more than three decades until we are at the mercy of white and chinese male engineers and researchers we could not wait that day in 2018 we have to act fast. You cannot wait today. You have to act now. Our power question is Mandela, since we have all the South Africans in the room. Uh, he said, I have, I read, I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. Make sure to pause and enjoy the view, then march on because with freedom comes great responsibility. So to that, I share that last year at this powerful global summit, there were two men representing Africa handing out pamphlets. They are Nick Bradshaw and John Kamara, who is moderating. Uh, so after that, myself, Nick, Selena, Dr. Amare in America, we set out on a journey to convince our great friends at the ITU that it was crucial for African innovators to be at this table so the world has an opportunity to benefit from the groundbreaking work that's happening on our continent. Today, the ITU has three, has agreed to have three sessions with up to 15 speakers of African descent. 60% of this particular one we help organize are women. So this is some great progress. It has been 500 years, but our voices edge ever closer, returning to the global innovation table. We will use it to speak, not just for black people and women, uh, but for Latin Americans, for Asians, for Europeans, and people in forgotten American states. We must stop our cycle of waiting for the world to change. We must stop waiting for our governments to magically do something on their own without our support. We must stop waiting for large global organizations to increase the representation in their staff because evidence shows that they don't have the motivation. We must stop waiting because for once, the same technology that, trans that threatens our relevance also provides us an opening to demonstrate a new path for its progression. AI for basic human needs. If I'm going to progress here. Oyeka Akuma did not wait when he went from discussing with my organization three years ago about finding mentors for his farm crowded startup in Nigeria uh, to now multiplying the yields of over 25,000 farmers 
in that country, earning him the current number 24 spot right next to Aliko Dankote as the top disruptor list in Africa. Eric Rima did not wait when he set up Tamboa Health in Kenya to damn the atrocious course of MRI machines by designing an AI tool that uh, on a phone such that you could place that phone on the back of a patient. It collects sound waves from their lungs and uses those waves to create images that medical practitioners can use to diagnose disease. You can imagine how much cheaper that is than buying an MRI that costs the same as building four hospitals in Kenya. We must not wait. Now, let's talk about the other villain, the digital divide. You see, digital transformation is like a fast moving train. From the platform, some people can stretch their legs and get on easy. Others have not been able to. They are divided from the digital world and all these opportunities. The 30 million of those people are actually in the United States of America, by the way. So once again, it's a problem that we share together as a globe and should address together. In parts of Africa, we obviously have small percentages who have access and ability to pay comfortably for this internet. They are a very important group. But our challenge today is to come up with a plan that will beat that divide down this decade. My fellow panelists, I place your logos on the, on the chat too. We will see how you think about that when we have our discussions. I spoke about this very topic at a Pan-African conference in Egypt last December and was told that Africa was too behind to talk about AI. My response was that if you look at Africa in short periods, you will find problems. But if you look at it decade to decade, you will find commendable growth, growth that we can build on to design the future of our economies. You will agree. There are Africans working at key positions for key organizations around the world. So our organization, Alliance for Africa's Intelligence, Alliance for AI for short, is laser focused on the future of our lives. Our approach is to tap into Africa's smartest minds around the world to get people acting on crucial matters that can't wait, experimenting and piloting programs until for-profit bodies, governments, or large organizations pick them up to scale them. Our key principles are, as you see, hashtag one brain, hashtag love, and hashtag each one teach two. The old plan was that leaders today have a focus on consumers. How do they think, you know, how do we find a hundred billion dollars to borrow so we provide electricity and internet so people can consume? And that is important, but this is solving the equation a little backwards. Uh, hence, it hasn't worked properly for over 20 years. It doesn't start with small steps from the people that cascade into a domino effect, I like to call it. The AI revolution is not about consumers, it's about builders. AI is today. We must shift the tide from being consumers and seekers of aid towards being builders of solution. So, the Alliance for AI path to initiating your four IR domino effect wherever you are in the world. We think you should identify your builders to activate them. You should meet the learners where they are. And there's an X factor, which you will tell me about at the end of this speech. Supercomputers. The builders need supercomputers and enabling policy. We must select these builders those in our nations that we want to activate, even if it's just five companies. I mean, China started with Alibaba and Baidu. Uh, your builders need these things to succeed. There's already progress as African innovators raised over $1 million last year. Uh, connectivity cost is going down over time if you look at it decade to decade, and mobile penetration is going up. But we are ready for the next wave. 
I hope Strive Maishiwa is listening because uh, the last wave it was started by, by him and it created millions of jobs, which was mobile. The next wave is indeed supercomputers. These, you can think of them as very powerful laptops to a room filled with powerful machines. The world didn't have modern AI that we're all talking about until 2012, when a GPU supercomputer started getting used to do AI. So how can Africa innovators build competitive AI without much easier access to supercomputers when their counterparts around the world have this easy? You see, it'll take an African innovator two months to train a complex but important and useful AI model that will only take their counterparts a few hours in San Francisco with a small supercomputer, not even a big one. There's just one supercomputer in Africa today and it's built and managed by my good friend, Happy Sitoli in South Africa. Uh, I was involved in the deployment of every single NVIDIA GPU supercomputer in the cloud today. So my evolving perspective is that when you are deploying your products and people are paying for it, yes, you can do that on the cloud. Uh, but when you are learning and experimenting to build, it's crazy to use the cloud uh, that you're paying for when your competition in America have hundreds of thousands of free cloud credits or even work with their governments to build supercomputers. So we need to solve this for our builders in Africa. You could start this with a small pilot, either less than $100,000 for one startup hub with C5 companies or $500,000 for ACT. I will go $10 million to pilot this across four corners of the continent. I mean, we already spent $50 billion uh, to build infrastructure as Minister shared, or we can cut out a little slice just to test this whole concept of supercomputing. We already have a group of Africans deploying these very machines. So Alex, oh, yes, Alex, in, yes. Alex, in the interest of time, we're mm -hmm. gonna need you to uh, sort of wrap up real quick. Yes, yes, so I can, so I can go through this. Uh, if you give me three more minutes, I'll go through these. Uh, pretty much the supercomputings for the Builders are important. The education piece is incredibly important as well. We have to meet the learners where they are. You don't have to use the digital internet all the time. There's WhatsApp, there's radio, there's television. We at Alliance for AI are working. Uh, we've got Rose Gasicho over in Kenya. She's not, she's a little older than 20, but she's designing what we call a distributed crowd healing future of work learning plan where she has a library of capabilities important to the future. Dr. Marapio will talk more about this and my mentor Andrea Casey San Francisco as well. And we give this over to people to use that to learn in schools. It's already been piloted in Africa Leadership University in Rwanda, Africa Science Academy in Ghana, and in Subcon Tunisia. So the final X factor is really you. You have to be the market and buy African solutions. Let's do away with the current outdated narrative where that major news outlets propel that says Africa are only seekers of aid and not buyers of solutions. I mean, with COVID-19, Africans have built a number of solutions that the world is not looking at. So the domino effect, as I close, is about creating a thriving environment for the sharpest innovators, running campaigns that encourage local and international purchase of their offerings. Otherwise, there's no future of work if you're not buying African tools. Uh, completely new industries will get enabled, which will transform your societies to the point where you have enough well-fed, free-thinking human beings who will make up a majority of your governments. A responsible government leads you to your future. So the very last slide here. Well, now that's where you're in will continue to be one of the sidekicks of the government, ensuring we, the grassroots people, are making progress in Africa, in America, in Brazil, and all the forgotten minorities of the world. You see, we cannot fail. We will only succeed if you join the movement. Uh, we have space for volunteers, including musicians and sports players you should join, and those who want to fund our blueprint so we scale these programs. The final quote here, before you continue, John. Thank you, Alex. Coming from, uh, well, John, if you'll let me just close with this one, right? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, that is only when it is dark enough that you will see the stars. 
it's dark right now with COVID-19 lockdowns. And so if you're a star, I implore you to step out and be the star that the world will never forget. Thank you. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, on that note, be the star, which is an important, uh, important vision for the continent. And I think uh, just to echo what Alex has said, there are a number of solutions that are coming out of Africa in the AI space. And if you look at COVID-19, COVID-19 presents an opportunity for our governments to actually look inward and see what solutions that our own entrepreneurs, our startups, our private sectors are building that actually help um, this particular pandemic and every other industry. And it also allows us to be able to buy from our own and effectively uh, encourage our own startups to be able to actually do um, be part of the solution rather than always having to import solutions from everywhere in the world. So I do encourage um, the government folks who are listening here to, to look inwards in your countries and give uh, a number of these startups a chance to actually prove that they can be part of the solution because this is why we're saying uh, the startup ecosystem is the foundation for artificial intelligence and growth in Africa, according to um, uh, Minister uh, Stella earlier on. Uh, now we're gonna move on swiftly and we're gonna be talking to Dr. Um, Marakwe, who has been a pioneer for education and who is also one of the key women who has uh, influenced me a lot in regards to how you use artificial intelligence to solve problems in education and also how you look at the African ecosystem and create a process-based learning rather than outcome-based learning that allows us to create artificial intelligence models or artificial intelligence solutions that even help us train our own um, education system. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Marapa. Uh, please do welcome her from uh, the UNESCO headquarters. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kamara, and thanks for having me. And I thank the, the first two previous speakers. And let me build on what uh, Dr. Tsado kept uh, saying, that the future is now. Africa cannot wait. But at the same time, we have to take learners uh, from where they are. Um, my focus is on the future of AI in education in Africa uh, with a focus on young working population. And I, in order for us to talk about the future, we have to first acknowledge, as the Honorable Minister also uh, noted when she was talking about our feeble investment in infrastructure and in AI, we have to acknowledge where we are. If we say the future is now, where are we in education in Africa today? And let me acknowledge that a lot of progress has been registered, especially since the education for all movement, but we are not sitting at a comfortable launching pad. And there we have to accept. Um, Africa has the youngest, uh, one of the youngest populations in the world. Uh, when you look at people who are between uh, 15 to 24 years constituting about 16% uh, of the population, but importantly that by 2025 projections are that the 15 to 24 year olds will increase from the 226 million they were in 2015 uh, by they will double or a little bit more than double. The second part is if you look at our zero to 15 years old, they account for a little over 40%. So Africa is young, but the moral of the story is that the shot of it is that Africa's population has to be either in learning institutions or just entering the the labor market. This is where the bulk of Africa lies. This is where the future of Africa is. The future of Africa is right where its children are. And anything else like AI and ourselves can only be wise by investing well in the future, which is the, the youth. It's a remarkable energy if we invest uh, wisely on them. Now, while Africa, the best part of Africa ought to be in learning institutions. 
Af Sub-Saharan Africa in particular has very limited access to, to education opportunities. Just to quickly say, almost 60% of young people of 15 to 17 years or of age are not in any form of education institution or process. And access to higher education is about 9%. This is very low compared to other regions. If you look lower to six to 11 year olds who are out of school, it's almost um, one fifth of the children. This is not a good uh, starting point from education. The quality of education is a challenge and it manifests itself in the high proportion of both primary and secondary school teachers who are less qualified compared to their counterparts. And there are reasons for this we cannot go in depth with. The Honorable Minister mentioned some of the legacies of apartheid. The apartheid legacy is, is, uh, is in the short in the recent history, but Africa has struggled with establishing good quality education for long. We have acute shortages of teachers in Africa, about 70 million. We will need 17 million new teachers by 2030 if we are to make a any progress towards uh, uh, the, where the world is. And we have rampant shortage of other traditional resources. This impact on the quality is expressed in the learning outcomes. Globally, yes, we have the global learning crisis where nearly two thirds of 600 million uh, school age children are not acquiring basic competencies, but for Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa it is, uh, accounts for 32.7, almost 33% of these kids who are not making the basic minimum competencies of just basic reading and numeracy before we get into digital literacy and all those things that we should be on. So that's the picture in education. Now looking at the participation of African youth in the labor market, at a quick glance, it looks as if Sub-Saharan Africa is not doing too far compared to world average because the 2019 youth labor force participation rate in Sub-Saharan Africa is about 48%. And this is uh, that is not too far from the world average is about 53%. However, if you go below the surface, these young people are in poor quality work so they are doing poor quality work under poor environment with very little uh, remuneration, especially for African young women. So there's a gender dimension there. Employment is predominantly in the informal sector, in the informal economy, and the employment itself is informal. Consequently, even though it looks like we have a 48% participation, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, about 13% of these employed young Africans uh, live in uh, extreme poverty. They, they are called workers who are, um, they are in working poverty. And then an additional 17% is in moderate poverty. So we actually have African young people which means they are in the lower ranks of the skills. And we know projections are all that the, the higher risk of losing job and work are those people who are in the lower ranks of the skills, semi-skills to the middle level skills, particularly middle level skills, because their, their tasks can be quickly automated. So now if we have this challenge, uh, the Honorable Minister spoke of policies. It means, as she to spoke about AI policies, they have to be integrated with economic growth policies to create jobs for higher level skills. But because higher level skills create jobs for middle and lower level skills, it has to be integrated with education policies that emphasizes quality, relevance, uh, resource efficiency, and equity. 
So what is it that AI can do to take us towards a more desirable future? I'm gonna be very fast before Kamara tells me. So if I speak very fast, please excuse me. I think AI can enable us to open the global uh, virtual classrooms. This is happening in higher education through MOOCs. There shouldn't be any reason why it cannot happen in lower levels of education and in order to open access, and this is desperately needed. But as the Honorable Minister mentioned, COVID-19 gave us a good wake-up call, a rude awakening. Africa has a compounded challenge of reducing access because of language barriers. It's the one continent where learners of all ages are taught and they engage in their learning experience through foreign languages. And so they have the double handle of dealing with the language and then with the concepts that they are being taught. And with the AI can break some of these areas, perhaps with simple things like plug-in uh, translators that can help learners to learn in their languages slowly and slowly. We have many, too many of them, but we can standardize orthographies across groups of languages if we are serious about alleviating the burden and AI could pay, play a, a huge role. AI can also help to, be, to make our access to education more inclusive by opening uh, to the otherly abled persons, like the visually impaired through audio facilities, for the physically impaired, because we can then take education to them rather than ask them to come to it. And also for those with audio, uh, auditory impairment, because then we can provide subtext. And the, so the first challenge that Africa has is access, and AI has multiple roles. The second challenge is moving curricula towards relevance. A, a lot of curricula in African countries look like curricula from any other place. They are very generic, they are devo devoid of context, and they're not well grounded. And AI can help us translate curricula into lifelong learning systems themselves before we can count on them to, to, to support lifelong learners. But to do so means to create curricula that are flexible enough that are futuristic enough. Now, if we talk about futuristic enough, we have, we can tap on AI to collect data, the oxygen of our days, the minister calls it, and to support us with um, uh, big data analytics to serve as observatories for trends in future competences that are needed in life and at work, but also to enable us to update curricula real time rather than be implementing obsolete curricula. And AI can do that, which is very difficult to do now as we use paper and pen type of uh, curricular documents. We need to mainstream AI and other technologies, emerging technologies, into our curricula, not just um, as learning. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Marafe, that, um, so I'll just give you two minutes to wrap up so that we can get onto the panel discussion. I actually put my timer on, so I, am t I put myself on 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm very careful about that. Don't worry. When my timer goes, my 15 minutes will be over. Um, so we need to mainstream, uh, not just a learning area, but as a way of educating and a, a way of learning and to make curricular reforms more affordable. Now, when it comes to effective learning, AI has a lot of um, potential to help learners engage in self-directed learning and to enable them into self self-benefiting agencies. It also has the potential to help us mainstream what are otherwise very difficult competences beyond the traditional disciplines, like collaboration, teamwork, negotiation, uh, interacting with the world, interacting with others, multiculturalism, 
we can actually not only mainstream these through, through AI, but we can observe the learning process and changes through AI as they happen and allow for the ability to monitor these so-called 21st century competences. AI can help us differentiate learning and customize learning and it can also help us sustain learning in and outside the classroom. Equally, AI can address shortages of teachers by pooling the few master teachers that we have so they can teach the world instead of just the kids in front of them. But as the teachers do that, the master teachers do that, with the novice teachers in class, we kill two birds with one stone because we are exposing learners to high quality learning and teaching, but we are also giving teachers on the job training that is very concrete and uh, easily and readily available. And we can buy through AI, we can buy teachers time efficiency. One thing that teachers are, a resource that teachers are poor in is time. And a lot of that, the, the time is taken by administrative tasks that can be quickly routinized. Even lower level teaching tasks, like assessing lower level skills that need to be automated, like automaticity in reading, automaticity in literacy, this can be achieved by applying it's five AI o'clock. easily. We can boost uh, also the rigor of continuous assessment particularly in a competence-based environment where we emphasize the developmental progression. And if we have carefully designed rubrics, AI can help us do continuous assessment instead of de uh, depending too heavily on, what do we call it, uh, national exams that you have to wait years before you know that kids were not learning. And it, AI can help us close the assessment, feedback, and responsive pedagogical loop, which things are very difficult for teachers to do in the classroom. Now quickly on youth, AI has, can help us provide youth updates on competence trends, as I said. They can locate the demand in the global uh, labor market. Where are the demands for these competencies? So our youth can know that they work for the world and not for just Africa. The AI can provide a virtual marketplace to match demand to supply. And AI can provide real time opportunities for continuous reskilling and upskilling. Now, do we have the capability? in terms of AI, the Honorable Ministers touched on this, but I think I can leave that to discussion. Yes, that would be, um, I mean, Dr. Marape, um, that's absolutely fantastic session. Um, and I think a couple of the things that we've gotten out of that is, you know, how AI can allow us create customized education and also how we can use artificial intelligence as well to be able to create a decentralized federated learning process, which obviously means that we can get the best of the best to teach everybody while everybody else learns within that same ecosystem, layering artificial intelligence on top of it to allow us now provide a, a systematic process of learning that develops the minds of the young people in Africa. Uh, we really, really appreciate you, uh, Dr. Marope, for the uh, insight you've given us and also how you and the UNESCO organization are thinking about AI as a future for Africa. Now we're going to go into uh, the panel discussion, which is a uh, quite an exciting uh, panel of um, experts that we have um, lined up for this session. Um, so for those of you who are just coming on board, I'll introduce myself very quickly and introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, my name is John Kamara. I'm the director for the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa uh, in Cape Town. I'm also the founder of uh, Afia Record here in Nairobi, which is an AI-driven health tech platform uh, where we are, as we're saying, solving um, health tech issues, COVID-19 issues, using our AI as part of the solution within this ecosystem. And we'll be talking a bit more about that. I'd like to then introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, Alex Sado, um, who you met earlier on, uh, we'll give them one minute each to introduce themselves. 
Uh, Alex, would you introduce yourself for a minute? All right, I was just uh, setting this back up. Um, yes, I think you've already heard a lot of me uh, a moment ago, but yes, Alexander Sado, uh, so co-founder and uh, board chair of Alliance for AI, and you must be quite familiar with us now as, as we are really set up to help accelerate anyone who's interested in the post industrial revolution. We'll help accelerate them from the point where they have almost no knowledge of what's going on, which programs that go all the way up to, to being an elite global player because that's what we think is really, do, can really differentiate folks from Africa. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, we're also gonna bring in uh, one of my um, really favorite people lately that I've been talking to a lot, um, Selena Lee, who is um, creating a huge community for artificial intelligence and data science in Africa. Selena. Hi, hi. It's great to be here. My name is Selena Lee. I'm dialing in from Cape Town, South Africa, um, and I'm the CEO of Zindi. Zindi is a data science competition platform focused on the African market. We host a community of 15,000 data scientists across Africa solving some of the world's most pressing business and social challenges using AI and data science. Uh, thank you, Selena. Our uh, next uh, panelist is uh, somebody I've gotten to know quite well the past few days. We've had a few chat um, late night in California and early morning here. Uh, Brian Talebi. Brian, please introduce yourself. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's fantastic to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm the CEO of Ahura AI. We invent a technology that enables people to learn three to five times faster than traditional education by using artificial intelligence and by collecting over 10,000 data points every second. So in addition to selling our technology to uh, corporations here in the United States and around the world, for every license that we sell, we give away a free license to members of underserved communities globally, especially with a gender lens, and we have a heavy focus on Africa. Thank you. Um, and finally, we uh, want to introduce um, Toyo Siakarele Obujusi. Um, who is uh, joining us from Nigeria. Um, we're waiting for her to join us, um, but we will start the panel because of time and when she joins us, we will continue. So um, this, this panel, as you can see, we've, uh, we've chosen quite an interesting panel because one of the key topics for this year is education, learning, and accessibility for AI. And obviously this is AI for good and there's a lot of you know, social AI solutions and discussions that we want. So I'm gonna start with Selena. Selena, uh, one of the things I wanna to talk to you about, ask you is about social good in AI and how is that, um, what we call a commercially viable operation that allows you to scale businesses, but at the same time provide the social infrastructures that we need to help the continent with, you know, building the community of data science and AI experts. Sure. Um, so when we created Zindi, we created Zindi with the recognition that there were organizations and companies across Africa that were generating more and more data. And so we were living in a world of data abundance. But at the same time, organizations didn't necessarily have the skills to extract the full value of that data through technologies like AI and machine learning. Um, and at the same time, we realized that there was this growing community, this pool of young talent, up and coming data science talent in Africa that was really going under the radar in terms of um, you know, these organizations knowing about them. So I think in terms of social impact, um, just just putting the pieces of the puzzle together, just creating a space where um, the organizations and companies that need these data science solutions and talent, and at the same time, um, creating a space for African data scientists to showcase what they're capable of, to continue to hone their skills on real life problems and real life data sets, um, it's kind of a win-win. So, uh, you know, we're, we're adding business value, but at the same time, we're also creating um, you know, un, uh, new opportunities for, for African data scientists uh, in terms of employability and upskilling through, through real life problem solving. Uh, thank you, Selena. I'm gonna jump to you, Alex. What has been the challenges that you've seen in how we try to integrate artificial intelligence and things like basic machine learning into various ecosystems in Africa 
what are the challenges around education and what are the touch points you think government should be active about? The biggest challenge is really, well, education is the biggest challenge in terms of bringing any new technology into any ecosystem because that's the entry point. People need to know about technology and mass. Uh, today, uh, it's, it's really with the traditional education system as I come to understand it. Hopefully, Dr. Marupin might be able to comment on this as well. Uh, it's not built to change rapidly, as rapidly as technology is changing. And so it needs some support. Either it needs to be redesigned or there needs to be an opening for new kinds of uh, platforms to exist on top of the traditional platform. For example, you have many AI communities across the entire continent of Africa that are coming up with programs and initiatives to teach people about this new technology, right? And AI is not the last one. In the, in the next few years, there will be something new. It continues to change. And so we need to uh, set up the platforms to recognize these new systems that come on top of the traditional systems to support them. Some examples are Data Science Nigeria platform uh, and uh, AI Kenya. My, if I sat here, I would list about 80 of them that exist on, on the continent. Our organization, Alliance for AI, as I mentioned before, had, had created this distributed crowd healing program in the form of AI clubs that will want to distribute, not just to schools, but even religious centers like churches and mosques and other parts that will help people to learn. But we then call on the government to figure out a way to, to help recognize people who come with capabilities and not just folks who have degrees. I'm sure Brian will talk about this as well later on with his AI, uh, you know, incredible AI platform. It is truly cutting edge as the top companies in the world are leveraging what Brian is building. I'll pause. Thank you. Brian, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a different spin of a question that we're getting from the audience. One of the old, you know, they're asking, you, you, you sit in the US and obviously you were doing amazing stuff with it. How easy is it for a company here in Africa to be able to apply machine learning, one, because of the lack of education, which, and two, because of the cost of artificial intelligence, and how do they actually find this funding? And a lot of our audience want to know from you, what is your take on this and how do they, you know, proactively go around this situation? Sure, uh, that's a fantastic question. And uh, Alex, thank you very much for the kind words as well. So one of the interesting things about artificial intelligence right now is that uh, most of the algorithms that most AI companies use have been around for 30, 40 years. The biggest difference, the biggest differentiator for artificial intelligence companies now, whether they're here in the United States or in Africa, is the quantity and the quality of the data that you collect. Now, the cost of running artificial intelligence in your company for all of the people that are watching has plummeted because there are a lot of off the shelf uh, tools that you can buy from these large organizations that enable you to implement artificial intelligence into your existing platforms or into the companies that you have. The key is what is the data that you're collecting? How do you model your, uh, how do you uh, build those models in a way that the data is structured and clean and uh, provides value ultimately for the, the solution that you're trying to generate. Thank you. Um, Selena, I'm gonna go back to you again from a question from our audience. How do you think, what are the chances of survival for startups in the African ecosystem in the AI space? And we, we really want you to be honest here because people really wanna know that uh, you are right in the, in the center of it. Sure. I mean, speaking from the point of view of a startup uh, working in the AI space in Africa, I think, um, let's see, I mean, I feel, I feel optimistic. And part of the reason why I feel optimistic is because, like I said, we've reached 15,000 users on Zindi in about a year and a half. And every week we have hundreds of new data scientists that are joining the platform. And so the reason why I feel optimistic is because I feel like there is this movement that's happening in Africa, across Africa, from South Africa to Zimbabwe to Ghana to Tunisia, there's a movement that's happening. And so I think that while there's still a lot of challenges for startups in Africa, any startup in Africa, there's challenges in terms of, you know, raising enough capital and the market opportunities. But at the same time, if there's a space for a startup to succeed, I think that AI being on the cutting edge um, is well positioned. And on top of it, you have 
this driving force, which is the youth in Africa, which are upscaling quickly in this space and that will drive the innovations in this space. Okay, so Alex, I mean, uh, if you allow me to add to that a little bit, the um, piece I also see is the, is the uh, information arbitrage, right? Startups around the entire world, it's, just, it's hard for them to survive. But then across the world, many programs have been put together to provide support and guidance for these startups, provide free cloud credits, provide technical support, provide marketing support. These programs exist around the world. But those programs are somehow not aware that African startups are doing AI. And so they're not advertising to Africa. And so there needs to be someone connecting that. At Alliance for AI, we do the best we can. We make posts on Twitter every time we find out because we are in San Francisco and we're connected to all of this. So we see it and we know the opportunities. Um, but perhaps there's someone larger than us that can play this role as well and help plug this gap. Because you have the, the accelerators from Amazon, from Nvidia, from Google, from Alibaba. They're helping tens of thousands of startups across the world but their portfolio of African startups is very slim. Okay, so if we, if we take the conversation from them, Brian, do you think that there is a, a need for collaborative partnership within the startup ecosystem in Africa first? And then do you think that AI itself is too, too much of a mystical value that most startups don't really need? And how do you think Africa can leverage the opportunity that has been presented at the minute? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, look, collaboration is the key to success for any tech company. Part of the reason that San Francisco has done so well over the years and become the preeminent tech hub in the world is because of the level of collaboration where people don't see each other as necessarily competitors. They see each other as people that they're going to collaborate with over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, not hey, this is just one transaction or I have to beat this person at this other thing. It's all about how do we bring our uh, our talents together? How do we enable multiple companies to all be successful? And so um, I love what uh, the folks you guys are doing as far as bringing uh, uh, technology companies in Africa together to collaborate to enable them to be successful. And it's critical that they collaborate with uh, the United States as well. What was the second part of the question that you asked? We were talking about in terms of the mystifying AI, is it necessary yeah. and important that every company in Africa actually has to be AI driven? Absolutely. I would say it's necessary for every company around the world to be AI driven at this point. Look, artificial intelligence right now is where the internet was back in the 90s, where corporations were just beginning to realize that they need to have a website, they need to have an internet presence. And the ones that did were able to um, perform radically better than companies that did not to the point where a short period later, if you didn't have a website, you essentially didn't exist as a company. Artificial intelligence is the same thing. It's not some super complex idea. It's something that will impact every single industry, every single company around the world. And the folks that ignore it um, are going to go the same way as Blockbuster and um, other companies. Um, so it's, so it's really critical that every company has an AI strategy and AI plan and understands how to leverage data um, and uh, artificial intelligence to ultimately provide more value for their consumers and for uh, their environments. So we're saying Y2K might happen to the companies who don't necessarily embrace <laughs> care. <laughs> For those of you Basically. who are young enough. <laughs> um, one last, Selena, one last question before we go back to the audience again. Um, what, where do you see the role of the government in the push for artificial intelligence in Africa and specifically on health? How do you think AI can help us achieve some of the milestones we need to achieve during this COVID period? A lot of people want to know that. Sure. I mean, I think um, on the side of health, uh, yeah, I recently had a really interesting conversation where, uh, with someone about, about the role of AI in Africa um, in healthcare. And I think that, you know, it's, it's really about extending the limited resources that there are for healthcare, extending the reach, extending the, or in, increasing the efficiency of getting um, services out to more remote, less, um, less accessible spaces, less, less accessible people. Um, and so AI is maybe not even necessarily going to be as revolutionary as like, um, you know, a robot doctor, but it can be as simple as 
um, you know, diagnostics becoming more accessible and efficient, maybe mobile-based diagnostics, um, you know, so that, so that health extension health workers can, can escalate cases as they need to be. Um, so I think that AI will play a critical role um, in healthcare in Africa, for sure. Um, and in terms of the role of government, I'm not exactly, I think Alex probably has more, more experience um, in terms of the role of government in, in AI, but I think that, you know, there, we're seeing some barriers or potential barriers versus um, benefits in terms of data security and data privacy um, policies, you know, especially for Zindi, we work so across different markets. Um, in South Africa, you have Poppy. In other countries, you have more stringent or less stringent um, data, you know, policies. And so I think that, you know, that's, that's something that the governments will be looking at more carefully and that can either hinder or accelerate um, the use of AI in the market. Um, Toyo C just joined us. Um, Alex, I'm going to go to her real quick. Toyo C, can you hear me? Hi, John. I can hear you. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. Um, one very important question, and it's a quite a simple question for my audience, is do you think that governments actually understand artificial intelligence, one? <laughs> and do you think they use it as a buzzword, two? And do you think actually we need to train governments in Africa to actually understand what artificial intelligence is? So, Toyo C, over to you. Uh, thanks, very, thanks very much, uh, John. I, I think my answer to that question will be very direct, and I'll speak from the Nigerian perspective. Um, in the last couple of months, our Honorable Minister for Communications and the Nigerian IT Development Agency have been working around, you know, powering artificial intelligence and doing some work at the intersection of the public and the private sectors to ensure that we use, you know, AI to drive collaborative effort around solving problems, um, specifically in the area of information dissemination, education, policy making, and things like that. But one of the things that is very crucial for us to pay attention to is um, that as of today, African governments don't quite understand the, um, the multi-layered challenges that, you know, the continent does have and the uh, power that technology, we, we haven't quite mapped out what our technology priorities should be as individual nations and as a continent. So for example, yesterday, you may have seen it in the news that the Association of the Staff Union of Universities of Nigeria uh, said that e-learning is impossible in the country. And that is the academic union of universities of the, which is like the union of our university lecturers. Um, in a world where we've been on you know, partial and full lockdowns for the last couple of months, um, you would have thought that people should be seeking and trying to figure out what the potential solutions would be as to how we can you know, enhance learning and advance you know, the education of our children. But you have the, the lecturers themselves saying that e-learning is unable to work. And when you then think about the policy frameworks in all for I think we lost to your um, Obviously, the universities are not working in Nigeria, so the internet is down. So, where are we with basic technology in our education oh, policy like, making? All of the innovation that's happening. Say it again. Can you hear me? No, no, go ahead. We're listening can to you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, I was saying. Basic technology forms the, the, the very first level foundation upon which you can now begin to build more advanced technologies like artificial intelligence, data science, and other computational technologies. And you'd find that, I'd say that our governments do not understand the full scope of the power that technology does wield over our development as a continent. And I mean, to your question about whether we need to train governments, the first thing that we need to do is to perhaps begin a reorientation process on the mindsets of the people on the government side. Because all of the innovation that's currently happening within countries, I mean, I'll take Nigeria, my country, for example, you'd see that the systems that are powering technology, innovation, and growth, and come, all of that innovation are coming from the side of the private sector. Um, and, it's, uh, and all of this technology are even concentrated in certain cities around the country. It's, it's not even permeated all of the different states of the country yet. So do we need to train government before we even begin to train the government? It's even important for you to let 
for you to take re remove the politics that you know um, has held us down as a country and as a continent in such a way that our government officials don't resist technology because they think it will take their jobs away. For, help, Absolutely. For, for example, for us at Rise Networks, we're the first learning research and work readiness lab in the country. And one of the basic, most, one of the greatest challenges we face, even in you know, speaking to companies about training their staff, speaking to government about reskilling and upskilling people, you know, public servants on the government side, is that a lot of people are afraid that they hear artificial intelligence will take away their jobs. And so they're resisting it with all their power and their mind. But what we're telling Absolutely. them is artificial intelligence is simply non-biological non intelligence. It's only, it's even going to create more jobs. It will make our systems more efficient. And whether the government... Yeah, see, I, 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 see, I'm going to go to the next question. There's, there's really not much that the government of Africa can do about it. Can do. I, we agree with you uh, because of time. I'm going to ask one last question to you, Alex, and you'll be very quick about it. Two minutes. Yeah. Um, do you think that African investors understand artificial intelligence in terms of investing in our local startups here? And do you think the likes of the ITU, the UN funding organizations can do a bit more in terms of investing in AI-driven companies? This is a, a question by a lot of the people in the audience. So make it quick and fast. Yeah, uh, quick and fast is 100%. 100%, uh, there should be more funding coming into this. That was the entire, if I was to confess, the entire reason for this entire session was to create that awareness that there is AI happening in Africa and foundations and capable bodies should start to look into it and invest in it because this innovation coming out of Africa is very important and crucial and important to meet the United States development goals by 2030. These innovations are are accessible, affordable, and reusable across the entire world. Better, if you ask, allow me to say, than innovations coming from San Francisco, which tend to be a lot more expensive as they don't have the necessary context. And so um, then uh, just with 30 seconds to the government piece, governments around, I, I've had the privilege or honor to interact with governments across the entire world when you talk about deploying support computers to them. And I can say, Governments across the world don't understand AI, not just in Africa, but the way they fixed it was to create avenues for the private sector to influence the government and inform them. And with Africa, we must tap into the diaspora. You have Africans at the top of the top companies. They know what it is. There has to be we a must tap for them to into interact. the diaspora. Yes. Um, on that note, I'm going to have uh, give my closing remark before we hand back. Um, it's been an absolutely enjoyable session. Uh, thank you, Selena. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Alex, uh, Minister, uh, Dr. Marape. Um, also, everybody who has been part of this panel. My passion shows to you is very simple. I believe that Africa is a continent with numerous amounts of talent. The talent, we don't have shortage of talent, but we have shortage of decision makers and leaders who will allow us to enter that fourth industrial revolution so that it doesn't become a buzzword that we consistently throw around. And it's also important that we have the right people who actually govern these institutions and who govern the process of the next level of information that we use to generate value in our continent. Where, where we are right at the cusp of history, and if you look at history across uh, multiple generations, there's always a time in life when there is a shift and a dynamic shift in change. COVID-19, climatic conditions, all these things are part of those signs that are telling us there is going to be a new economic power. And there is no reason why Africa cannot be that economic power. So our governments, our private sector, our VCs, our investors have to rethink how they invest, how they provide solutions, how they provide opportunities, and also how they look inwards to allow our own startup, our own private companies. And most importantly, we must trust ourselves enough to make mistakes that allow us to learn very quickly and become the proponents of our own history. There is no reason why we can't have AI companies from Africa building AI solutions that can sell in America. There is no reason why we can't do the same in Europe and anywhere else. And the diaspora that we have becomes a massive opportunity for us to leapfrog this technology and use it to drive the value of our young generation where we own the youth infrastructure in the world. 
So I'm really excited to be part of this change. I think there's a lot of things happening. I think governments should look in where during this COVID period, it presents them an opportunity to look at all the startups in your country that are actually doing amazing things. Focus on those startups, try to help them, invest in them, take a chance because the UN ITU can only provide these sort of opportunities, but we need to embrace it ourselves. Thank you very much. My name is John Kamara from Mafia Record, uh, Alex Addo, Brian Talabi, Selena, and the ITU. Kesna, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and especially for the amazing time management. It was great. And big thanks to our distinguished speakers and the audience for such an interactive discussion. We would like to also thank our partners and sponsors for their continuous support. Next week, we have three AI for Good sessions. The AI for Gender Inequality Breakthrough Track to be held on 23rd June. The launch of the Global is Dialogue on Esports to be held on Wednesday, 24th June. And the AI for Good Innovation Factory live pitching session to be held on Friday, 26th June. For more information, please visit our website, aiforgood.itu.int or follow us on social media. We will also post all the information in our chat. So thank you very much and see you next week.